Hi. Uh, is the sound okay? I think so. Okay. Thank you. So, I'm Daniel Becker, and I'm going to talk about uh, using iceberg metadata tables in Apache Impala. So, this is what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, both on Apache Impala and Apache Iceberg. Then I'm going to talk about uh, Iceberg metadata-related features in Impala, and finally, how we implemented these features. So first, some background. What is Apache Impala? It is a database engine uh, that is massively parallel and used in big data. And uh, it was originally designed for the Hadoop ecosystem. Its main feature has always been speed. So we always want to run queries as fast as we can. Uh, Impala consists of two parts. Uh, the first one, which we call the backend, is written in C++, and it is responsible for uh, distributed query execution. And the second one, which we call the front end, is responsible for uh, mostly for query compilation uh, and uh, scheduling um, and optimization. Impala supports various storage systems. Uh, it was originally designed for the Hadoop distributed file system, but now we also support uh, cloud storage like S3 and also external uh, data storage engines like Kudu or HBase. In terms of table formats, we used to rely on the Hive table format, but now we also support Iceberg, which is the topic of this presentation. Uh, we also support different file formats, Parquet being the most important one, uh, but we also support others like ORC, uh, text files and others. So this is uh, the overview of the architecture of Apache Impala. Uh, at the bottom, uh, you can see uh, the storage layer. Uh, well, actually, the green parts are uh, internal parts of Impala. The others are external services that we rely on. So the storage is down there. Uh, and uh, above it, you've got the execution layer, where you've got two kinds of Impala roles. There's the executor and the coordinator. The coordinator is responsible for handling client requests, uh, compiling and optimizing queries, and um, scheduling and coordinating query execution on the cluster. The executors, there are usually many of them, they are workers, so they get tasks from the coordinators and execute them. They also talk to uh, other they talk to the coordinator and other executors also. And up here, you've got uh, the metadata and control layer. Uh, the most important thing is probably the Hive Metastore, which you can see here. So that is an external uh, service. That is uh, the top level storage uh, location of metadata. So this is where you can find information about where your table is, how you can read it, or where you can find it. The catalog. Uh, just left to it, is something like a proxy between uh, the other parts of Impala and uh, the Hive Metastore. Uh, it caches the data that it gets from the Metastore, so we don't always have to go to the Metastore and ask for, for information. And this makes Impala a lot faster. Uh, something that's also important is the state store, which uh, stores uh, the state of the whole cluster. So for example, if uh, one of your executors crashes, or gets disconnected, then it is the state store that will tell all the other components in the cluster that this has happened. Now, the other thing, what is Apache Iceberg? So this is a table format uh, for huge analytical data sets. And the table format is essentially a way to tell uh, what is your table, what is your table metadata, what is your table data, and how it is stored. So uh, Iceberg is designed for uh, big data from the beginning, and it also supports uh, various file formats. Uh, but in Impala, when used with Iceberg, we only support Parquet. Uh, Parquet uh, sorry, Iceberg supports uh, different um, operations, like for example, inserts, uh, deletes, and updates. 
and in case of the latter two, where there's some uh, deletion going on, we've got uh, uh, a special option. So instead of rewriting the data files, we can also write delete data files, uh, which makes writing much faster. It makes reading a bit slower, so there's a compromise there. Uh, Iceberg also allows uh, you to change the schema or the partitioning without rewriting the table. And it also supports hidden partitioning, which means that you don't have to care about partitioning in your queries. You just write them and uh, the system will take care of efficient execution. Uh, a very good feature of Iceberg is that it allows you to take or allows you to go back to previous snapshots, so previous states of the table. So if you make a mistake, you can go back and try again. Uh, you can also tag these snapshots or you can query previous um, states of the table without actually going back. And uh, very importantly, the Iceberg project provides a library uh, with uh, which we can interact with Iceberg tables and that's something that we use in Impala. So here you can see the architecture of uh, Iceberg. At the top, you've got a catalog. It can be various types of catalogs, but uh, the main requirement is that uh, there needs to be a pointer that points to the top level metadata file for each table. And updating this pointer has to be atomic. Then you've got uh, the metadata layer, in which uh, you've got various layers of metadata files, which ultimately point to data files. So this is how you know what data is part of your table. Now, what are Iceberg metadata tables? So, of course, Iceberg stores lots of metadata for each table, for each Iceberg table. Uh, some of this metadata is useful for table maintenance, like, for example, how many files you've got in your table, or whether you have delete files, etc. And some other uh, metadata is useful for query engines to make more efficient query plans, like null values, value counts, min-max values, etc. And uh, the Iceberg library, uh, which I mentioned, uh, provides us a way to use this metadata as if they were tables of views. And this is what we call metadata tables. And in Apache Impala, we've made it possible to to query these uh, metadata tables almost completely as if they were regular tables. So this is the list of metadata tables that Iceberg provides us. Uh, on the left, you can see tables which uh, uh, contain information about the latest snapshot. In the middle, you've got uh, corresponding tables uh, prefixed with all, uh, which contain the same data but uh, across all of the snapshots. So this is, as if it were, a union of all of these tables. Uh, I mean, all this data across all the snapshots. And on the right, you can see other tables which are mostly snapshot independent or just simply don't have a corresponding uh, table with all. Uh, and Iceberg metadata tables in Impala can be used uh, very much like regular tables, so you can query them, you can filter them, you can join them with uh, other metadata tables or, or simple tables. And a difference is that they always have to be uh, accessed with fully qualified paths, and this is something that we've taken from Hive, because we want it to be compatible on this. Here you've got an example uh, where you have uh, this metadata table. So the metadata table name is history. The regular table to which it belongs is iceberg query metadata, which resides in the functional parquet database. So this is how you query one of the columns of this metadata table. Now, metadata tables are always read-only in Impala, so you can't change the metadata through them. You can't create new ones or you can't uh, drop existing tables. Now I'm going to talk about uh, what kind of features regarding Iceberg metadata tables we've got in Impala. So the first command that you can use is show metadata tables, which will simply list all the metadata tables belonging to a certain table. And you can also filter this using a pattern. Now, 
At present, all iceberg tables have the same metadata tables, so this command is mostly for convenience. Uh, it doesn't give you information that you can't retrieve from the website or something. But in the future, it's possible that we could enhance it and limit access to some of the tables, some of the metadata tables, based on user privileges. So here's another example. Here you've got show metadata, yeah, show metadata tables in functional parquet, this is the database, and in parallel query metadata, this is the iceberg table. And this will list the metadata tables. It's the same list uh, that I've shown before where you've got the green uh, and blue tables. The next one is describe. So just like regular tables, metadata tables also have a schema. And if you'd like to query this schema, you can use the describe command just like for regular tables. So for example, we've got this history table I've used before. Here is the schema. So it's got four columns. Here you can see their types and also some extra information. And most importantly, you can query metadata tables usually using the, uh, the usual select statement. You can uh, query individual columns or all of them using the star. Um, and here you've got a, a bit of difference between uh, metadata tables and regular tables in Impala. Because for regular tables, for historical reasons, Impala doesn't uh, include complex types in the result sets. Complex types are arrays, maps, or structs. Uh, so we didn't use to support them, but now we do. But they are still not included uh, normally in select star lists. But for metadata tables, they are always included. Uh, of course, you can filter uh, these uh, results that you get from querying metadata tables. You can aggregate over them, and you can join them. So here's a, an example where you take two metadata tables from the same iceberg table. You join them uh, on a condition. You, you're only interested in append operations, so you can uh, discard the rest. And uh, we also want to sort it. Now, a few words about how we implemented these features in Impala. Uh, of course, we had to make some changes, for example, in the parser, uh, the planner, and the executor. So we wanted to accept this new syntax to refer to metadata tables, which is uh, what I have used so far. It's uh, database name dot table name dot metadata table name. And uh, also we introduced a new uh, iceberg metadata scan node in the planner and executor. Uh, an important thing is that iceberg metadata scanning has to be done on coordinators. If you remember from the beginning uh, or, or the image uh, about the architecture, there are executors and coordinators. But reading metadata tables has to be done on coordinators because executors don't have the necessary information. Uh, and uh, as I've said, we use the iceberg library to obtain this information about uh, metadata tables. But there's a small problem. The iceberg, the iceberg library is written in Java, but execution in Impala is written in C++. So what can we do? Uh, the solution is to use the Java native interface, uh, which allows us to call Java code from native C++ code. How does this work? Uh, you probably know that Java and C++ have very different memory management models. Uh, in Java, you've got uh, tracing garbage collection, while in Impala, you've got, uh, sorry, while in C++, you have manual memory management. Of course, you can use smart pointers, but that is nothing more than something built upon manual memory management. So, uh, we'd like to use Java objects in our C++ code. What can we do? Uh, it would be problematic if the JVM uh, garbage collected these Java objects while we were using them in C++, so we have to use uh, JNI references. There are two types of JNI references which keep uh, the garbage collection from collecting these objects. The first one is local, this is the default, and local references are valid until execution returns to Java code. So we are using these objects in C++ code, and when we return to Java, then these references are cleared up for us. 
They can also be cleared manually, uh, but you don't have to. But it is useful if you've got lots of objects or very big objects. The other kind is uh, the global reference, which can be obtained from local references. Uh, and this is fully manually managed, but sometimes you need to use it. Uh, and now, uh, the architecture of Iceberg metadata uh, table reading in Impala. So you've got, uh, we've got uh, some classes that we implemented here. The first is the Iceberg metadata scanner. There's a uh, Java version and C++ version. It is the Java version that uses the Iceberg API to fetch rows from the metadata tables. Uh, so it is in Java code, and the C++ counterpart is mostly a wrapper around this Java class. It calls uh, the methods of the Java class using JNI, and it's also got some helper functions related to, to JNI also. Uh, the next one is the Iceberg Row Reader, which is used to convert uh, rows uh, which are represented as Java objects. Uh, to convert them into uh, native uh, representations in Impala. And the most important class here is the Iceberg Metadata Scan node, which is in a, a native C++ code. And this is the class that orchestrates uh, the scanning of metadata. Here you can see the scan flow. So this is what we do when we are reading metadata tables. It starts in C++. We get uh, an object uh, of class uh, of type uh, front-end iceberg table from the front-end. So the front-end is the Java part of Impala. Uh, it creates an iceberg metadata scanner object, uh, the Java version, on the Java heap. Then uh, triggers uh, metadata table creation and reading uh, still in Java. Uh, the Java part executes the reading and returns uh, results, but um, First, so um, in the Impala model, you've got this uh, get next function, which is called, which you call when you'd like to get the next uh, row from uh, the table. And uh, so the C++ class, when its get next method is called, it calls uh, the get next method of uh, the Java class, and Java returns a row, which we then need to convert into our native uh, representation. And lastly, a few words about these conversions. So conversions from Java representations to native representations. For some types, it's, it is trivial. Uh, so we don't really have to do anything other than copying the bytes. This is true for Booleans, uh, integers, floating point numbers, and also dates, although we've got some validity checking there. But for other types, it can be a bit more difficult. So for example, strings and binary data, um, it is a bit more complicated because the Java types have to be converted from their original types into a byte buffer, uh, which is then manually managed. Uh, so it is an exception to local and global references. You always have to manage uh, their lifetimes manually. Uh, and we've also got uh, a bit of difficulty because Java uses uh, some encoding that's similar to UTF-8 for strings, but it's not completely the same. But in Impala, we've chosen to ignore it and just take it as it is. And uh, another thing is for binary data. So normally, Impala writes binary data as it is. But Impala writes complex types like arrays and maps in JSON format but arbitrary uh, bytes uh, don't really fit into JSON format because it can make it invalid. So we convert binary data into base64 representation. The next type with problems is decimal. Uh, and actually that's not supported yet for metadata tables in Impala. It's supported for regular tables, but not metadata tables. And this is because uh, we haven't been able to write the conversion yet. Uh, we actually didn't have time. Um, but the problem is that Java represents these decimal numbers uh, with infinite precision, and in Impala we have to use uh, fixed precision. But this, this is not really a 
big problem because uh, decimals don't usually occur in iceberg metadata tables. They only occur if uh, the corresponding regular table contains decimal columns. And finally, the most important or maybe most interesting conversion is the conversion of collections. So collections are arrays and maps. In Impala, we have to represent collections in memory in a way that elements are contiguous. So we, each element follows uh, the previous one. But Java doesn't do it like that. Java stores references or pointers to its elements, so we can't really copy a Java collection uh, byte-wise uh, into native code. Um, what we have to do is uh, construct and convert the elements one by one, which can be done using JNI, but it's quite cumbersome. So we've come up with a solution where we include uh, a helper class, which we call Collection Scanner, which uh, uh, is written in Java, and it takes care of iterating over collections. It's got uh, the getNextCollectionItem method, which is easy to pull from JNI, and uh, it always returns the next item, taking care of iteration under the hood. So this is where we are now, uh, but we've also got plans for improvement. Uh, for example, obviously adding support for decimals, and uh, also there's an idea about refactoring the code. Uh, so instead of uh, the present scheme, we could do all the conversions on the Java side and give back uh, simple binary buffers. And this could be beneficial because uh, reading code with lots of JNI calls can be difficult and uh, especially Java exception handling from C++ code is very easy to uh, get wrong. So uh, it might be a better approach to minimize JNI. So that was it. Thank you for listening to me. Fei Chang Ka If you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, so, do you plan to scan the iceberg metadata using C++, C++ codes? In some scenario that the table has lots of snapshots, probably the manifest files are super large, and su um, so many. So maybe native codes will perform better? Uh, yes, it could perform better, but uh, uh, so far, we've been using the iceberg library to do a metadata scanning and also in other places. So uh, it would be a major undertaking to write it in C++. So I don't think we are planning that right now. But if, if it turns out that it's really slow and uh, we've got users that really need it, then that's a possibility. <laughs>